Welcome. So what makes a good investment? That's the question that we're going to answer today in a brand new series that I'm starting here called Money Matters. Okay, because money does matter if you live here on Earth and the matters of money are really important for us to understand. If you're brand new to me, my name is Susan McVeigh. I'm a married mama of two and I am a business sales and wealth strategist and a kingdom business builder. And today we're answering this question, what makes a good investment? Because the number one question that I get asked is what should I invest in? Now, we're not gonna cover that. Uh, we'll probably touch on that a little bit because the truth is it actually doesn't really matter. Um, and I'm going to, I'm going to prove to you why that is as we go through this today. Of course, it's been uh, an odd day <laughs> with people coming to the door. So I might have to pause. Give me a second here. <laughs> Okay, I apologize. Of course, always when I um, decide to go live. So what makes a good investment? If you have any, so number one, if you're on your live, say hello and where you're watching from. If you're watching on the replay, use hashtag replay and still let us know where you are watching from. And if you have any questions on this topic or on any other money matters topics, because this is a brand new series that I'm doing. So what makes a good investment? I'm, I have my notes here, so I'm going to be looking down as I go through. So first, I want us to define what is an investment because I think it's very important for us to have a common understanding so that we're, we're talking about the same things, right? So a lot of times we throw around these words, but we don't have proper context. And then because we don't have proper context, we might actually be talking about two totally different things. And so it's very important that we're on the same page. So according to Investopedia, so you can do your own research, which I highly recommend that you do. And before we get going in any of this information, this is for entertainment purposes. I'm providing this to educate you. And hopefully it might be a little bit fun, funny. We'll see. Um, but it's not financial advice. I am not your financial advisor. I am not licensed to be your financial advisor. I used to be licensed. And that's why I can share this information from my own experience, wisdom, and knowledge, and two decades of helping clients do this. And ultimately, I've been in the money-making business since I was seven. So that's 40 plus years, okay? Um, now, that being said, you need to take responsibility for your own money and make sure that you're comfortable. And what I often find from my past, as well as my present, and then probably still into the future, that most people, especially the women that I serve, number one, women actually make the best investors. Okay, so if you're on here and you're a woman, say hello, because women are very, very savvy investors. Most of the world likes to profile men, um, but men actually take more risks and they get lower returns when we when we take into account risk versus return. Women, and I'm making you know blanket statements because there obviously is anomalies in the men and not anomalies in the women, but from my past experience, women are they were women take the time to take into account all the things that I'm gonna share with you in order to properly assess and discern, right? To do the work that is not really sexy, in order to educate themselves, in order to make better investment decisions. The world likes to, to say that it's the men and the world of finance by which I come from is very heavily male dominated. But the reality is that the female investors, the client base that we deal with, which you and I comprise part of, that we often are better long-term holders of investors uh, of investments. We are more educated and more informed, and we're much more involved than our male counterparts might be. So all that being said, let's get into it. Um, 
with that caveat, okay? So defining investment. According to Investopedia, and as always, you do your own research, which is why I'm gonna give you some information so that you can actually go and do the research. Don't just believe me because I say what I'm saying. I want you to get into the habit of training yourself to go and check things out, right? Like It's good to trust yourself. It's good to trust other people, but there's a lot of shysters out there. And I want you to get into the habit of what you do for all things. Right? Like, don't just believe me because you believe me. Don't just believe anybody because you believe them. Let's be like, you know, the Bible says, don't be a hearer of the word, be a doer of the word. This is how we do the word. Okay. So an investment involves putting capital. So that's the amount that you have to use today in order to increase its value over time. An investment requires putting capital to work. Right. So again, that's your initial money. You put it to work in the form of time, money, effort, etc., in the hopes of a greater payoff in the future than what was originally put in. So this is very interesting because oftentimes we think about investments as what? As just money, right? But what Investopedia is telling us is investments actually are the capital, what you're putting in, like what what you start off with. So that includes time, it includes money, it includes effort, etc. Well, what's the etc? Well, what do you put in that you hope that there's a greater payoff? Because that's essentially what we're describing here, that whatever you put in, whether it's time, if you're putting time into something, then chances are you're hoping that there's a greater payoff. And it may not come in the payoff of time. It may come in the payoff of money. It may come in the payoff of relationships. It may come in the payoff of peace. It may come in the payoff of joy or um, skill building, right? So whatever you are investing, whatever you're putting into something, whatever that form is, the original, like in the Bible, we, we would call it a seed. You're going to sow a seed, right? You're going to plant something into the ground. What is that thing that you're planting? Is it love? Is it money? Is it time? Is it investment? So I want you to think for yourself, what in this season of life, what are you planting? What are you investing? And it could be multiple things. So interact with me here and let me know what you are investing. Are you investing money? Are you investing time? Are you investing relationships? Are you investing care? Are you investing um, joy, right? Like, the Bible calls the fruits of the spirit. So I want you to just think about uh, some of these things that we don't always typically think of as investments because we look at it very one-sided as in it's always going to be about monetary gain and monetary outlet outlay because that is very narrow-minded thinking. And this is according to Investopedia, which is a site that talks really heavily about investments, right? So according to Google, an investment is the action or process of investing money for profit or material result, a thing that is worth buying because it may be profitable or useful in the future. An act of devoting time, effort, or energy to a particular undertaking with the expectation of a worthwhile result. So again, we can see here that there is a money focus. But even according to Google, an investment isn't just money. It is the time, the effort, the energy that we're going to put into something. But the, the key thing here is that we're expecting to receive something back, right? So when you make an investment, you have an expectation. So what is the expectation, right? So if right now we're saying good, have you defined good? What makes a good investment for you? This is one of those things that if you were to Google this right now, which I did before I hopped on here, and because of my background, the information made sense to me. Now, if I wasn't particularly knowledgeable about investments, I could be led astray because there are millions and millions of entries on Google that are trying to tell you what is good. But what is good for one person may not be good for another person, okay? 
What I want you to understand is that when we use words like good, there is a scale. There is a, you know, this amount of good, this amount of good. They're both good, but which one is correct? Which one is right? I don't know. It depends. So the best people that are going to help you when asked by these questions are either going to ask more questions, which they should, or I would, I personally, I would run from the people that just blanket statement, everybody needs to invest in this. The reason being, I don't know you. They don't know you. They don't know what you've invested in. And we're going to go through these five key considerations that I want. I want you to write down. I want you to answer for yourself. But if they're not asking you these questions, they have no business giving you personal financial advice. They can give a blanket financial statement, right? So I'll give you an example. Oftentimes we hear, buy an index fund. Well, why? Right? Most people don't explain why. The reason why investment experts, which you don't even have to be an investment expert to tell people this, right? And that's why we need to be careful. If you just say buy an, an index fund, well, the reason is the index fund follows the stock exchange. So, and you, you can get one based off of any stock exchange in the world, right? So the stock exchange is where people go to trade stocks. So if it's a publicly traded company, so these are big, big companies, you know, we have, it's on the NASDAQ, the S&P here in Canada, it's the, the Toronto Stock Exchange, it would be the, the Nikkei, um, you know, every single country or region has a stock exchange. It's where the market goes to play. It was, it, you know, where they go and they're like, it's basically an auction. Like, I'll take that, sold, sold. Here's the price, don't no, sold, sold. Um, so when somebody says buy an index fund, it is because you're buying into a basket of goods. You're buying a little bit of Apple because maybe you can't afford to buy one whole share of Apple. Maybe you can't afford to buy a whole bunch of Tesla. Um, it, it takes a basket of goods and it fluctuates right? It fluctuates depending on how well the actual company is doing. Because if it doesn't hit the stock exchange in a certain parameter based off of the funds agreements, then you may or may not be investing in it. But here's the thing, the likelihood that the stock market is going to crash, which means the entire market just goes up and bottoms out over a longer period of time, is very very slow it's very very low it's very very slim right so if we look back on history because that's really all we can go on is what did it do before now what it did before is no guarantee of future performance and your investment advisors will tell you that like past history is not indicative of, a fu of future performance so we can't guarantee that granted however what we can do is look at patterns because the past performance is based off of human behavior. So knowing that humans don't change so fast, like <laughs> over decades and decades of living, we evolve very slowly, right? Which is a good thing, but it's also got some, some bad attached to that. So if we understand this about ourselves as a human race, then we can extrapolate out, meaning we can look back and say, okay, if that happened, then what is the likelihood that I personally believe that that's going to happen again? So if you personally believe that the stock market is going to keep going up on average over time, then investing in an index fund is good for you. But if you don't believe in the stock market at all, then you investing in an index fund will go against your personal values, your personal convictions, your personal beliefs. And it doesn't matter if it's going to make money because there's lots of ways to make money. There's lots of investments that will make you money, but you're going to question yourself each time you look at that investment simply because it doesn't match your requirements. It's not aligned. It's going to cause cognitive dissonance, which means what you expect and what you receive are not the same. And so it's going to create friction and it's going to make you go like, Ugh. the Bible says a double-minded man is very unstable in all of his ways. And that's essentially what cognitive dissonance is. It creates 
double mindedness. It, it means that you are constantly being like kind of ripped apart because what you're expecting and what you're getting, it, there's, there's a dissonance inside of you that then does not allow for peace. Okay. So I hope this is making sense. Um, if at any time I say something that you do not understand, please do not be so prideful. Like, don't be so ashamed or like, I should know this. Why? Why should you know this? Have you learned it? Most of us have not. The only reason why I have learned this is because this is what I got paid to do for two decades. And I, I still do this because now this is part of who I am. Does this make sense? Okay, so you're gonna wanna ask questions. That's okay. If you wanna do it publicly, I recommend it because there's no condemnation in Christ Jesus, but we also, the more you know, the more you can do better. So ask them in, in the comments because somebody else may have a question and there are no stupid questions. Um, it's just the way that you may ask it may not make sense, which is okay, right? This is where we're gonna learn together. So if it doesn't come to you until after, come back and rewatch because you may have to rewatch and pause. If you want to pause, I'm going to recommend that you go and watch this on my YouTube channel because it's way easier to watch the replay. That being said, you do you. So we just defined what an investment is, okay? So that's the first part. The second part then is what are the key factors that you need to understand in order to even be able to evaluate what makes a good investment for you? Because everybody's going to be different. And this is why we can't just take blanket investment statements or blanket investment recommendations without first investigating, does it meet my criteria? And I'm going to help you to understand what your criteria is. Now, if you're working with a licensed investment advisor, a financial planner of some kind, number one, make sure that they're accredited. Number two, make sure that they're licensed. Because if they're not, they should have no business telling you about what to do with your money. And that's why I personally will never tell you specifically what to put your money in. Because I could get in a lot of hot water. That's a story for another day. Okay, if you're tracking with me, because we're gonna move on to step two, uh, put some hearts or emojis, a thumbs up, a comment, something, because I wanna make sure that I'm going at an appropriate speed if you're on here right now. Hello, Linda. I see that you have joined here as well. Um, Lady B Morales, blessings from Connecticut. Hello, hello, my dear. Hello, Brianka. And Brianka's investing money, time, and talents. Love it. Okay. Um, so, number two, key factors. Okay, key factors. The first thing that I want you to consider is safety. So you're gonna you're gonna want to take notes. Okay. So safety. How important is safety to you? Now, my brain thinks very logically and linearly. So. What I would recommend that you do is just like make a chart and just and just rate it like one to 10. How important is safety? Number two is income. Do you need your money to actually produce income for you? Like, do you want your money to or your investments to replace your current income, your working income? OK, so moving from active income, which is the work, the workable income that you produce. Right. So when you go to jo a job, that's active. When you go to your business, that's active um, where you have to do something in order for the money to come. That's active. So do you want your income to, ch to change from income that is active into income that is more passive, where essentially the investment itself does the income producing activity for you. So that would be in the form of uh, dividend income, interest income, um, some capital gains. But that's we're going to talk about that separately, which is number three. So I want you to assess for yourself safety. How, how much safety do you need from your investments? And number two is income. How much income do you need your investments to provide for you? Because sometimes, like if you were retired, you would want your investments. That would be a very high consideration, right? Most people, when they're retired, 
their income is coming from investments. So a good investment for them, and it doesn't matter about the age, a good investment for somebody who's retired is going to be something that pays out a high level of income. How much risk that they're wanting to take, we're going to discuss that in just a moment. Okay, does this make sense? Are you tracking with me? So number one, safety, I want you to assess how important. Number two, income, how important. Number three is capital growth. This means that if you put in capital, like $1,000 or $100, how, much, how important is it that that money grows in value? So if you put in 100 bucks, do you expect that that money is going to become $1,000 when you go to take it out? Right? Now, remember, we've already assessed safety, how safe is your money? And number two, how much income does your money produce? Right? So those are already factors that you've assessed. So then the third one, because again, depending on where you are in your life, if you're later on in life, safety and income might be high, high on the list. And so if you put in a hundred bucks and it's giving you $10 a month for as long as you need it, you might not be needing that hundred dollars to actually grow to be more than a hundred bucks. You might be perfectly fine with that hundred dollars. Like when I need to take it out a year from now, two years from now, 10 years from now, 20 years from now, like I just want to make sure that that hundred dollars I can still access as my hundred bucks. That's what I'm talking about. But if you're on the flip side and you're saying, no, I only have a hundred dollars or I have a hundred dollars, but I need that money to become a thousand dollars, but I'm willing to wait a year, two years, three years, 10 years, 20 years, whatever it is. So that's going to depend on you. Okay. So again, the number three part for key factors I want you to identify is capital growth. How important is it for you? So in other words, all three of these pieces, it's like, I want you to think of it kind of like a three-legged stool. How much of each of these pieces are critical for you? And if you are investing joint money, so if you are married um, or you're investing on behalf of like adult children or even your parents, aging parents, I, this needs to be done together. Okay? Because what you'll find is often, with partners, you may have completely different ideas around safety, income, and growth, such that if you don't have conversations on it, clearly that you may have different expectations for what you want your money to do. Did you know that the number one leading cause of divorce is money? I can't even tell you how many times I would be sitting in my office back in corporate finance and I would have clients across the um, across the table from me. So literally like, you know, sitting there and I'd ask some questions around like, so what do you, what do you think retirement is going to look like? Or the, what are the goals? And that would be the first time that they would be talking about it. it would be with me in my office sitting there. There are times I had to leave because the conversation would get so heated uh, that I felt very uncomfortable being there. Uh, and I, you know, I, I'd have to go <laughs> give them some space. So I say all this because I want you to know that if you're uncomfortable having this conversation with your partner, that's okay. That's normal. If you're not uncomfortable, that's still okay right? Because um, that's normal for you. But I don't want you to not have these conversations simply because it makes you feel a certain way. Avoidance is not going to make this go away. Okay. In fact, with investments, the more time that you have, the better off you are, even if you do very, very little with this money. Okay. Very, very little. Like, um, I may, I may share a story. Um, I'm waiting for the Holy Spirit to confirm. One sec. 
Let me just make a note of it because it may or may not be appropriate. Um, no. Okay. So there's five key considerations. Okay. You're going to want to write these down. And again, if you join late or if you are not someplace where it's safe for you to write these down, it's okay. You can come back and rewatch this. Uh, if you need to pause, it's okay. Um, again, if you're on, if you go watch on YouTube, it's going to be easier because you can, you know, pause to the exact place. Instagram and Facebook is a, a little trickier. So number one, your personal risk tolerance. What are you willing to accept? So this is related to what we just assessed around safety, right? But this is very specific. Your personal risk tolerance, what are you willing to accept? And when you sit down with a licensed advisor, they should be asking you questions that are similar to this. In fact, they should be going through what's called a know your client. If you're investing on your own through a, an accredited financial institution, right? Like a licensed brokerage of some kind, even if it's self-serve, you will have to fill out questionnaire that is called know your client. They will ask you th these types of things. And if you've already done it, just put yes. If you know what I'm talking about, put yes, okay? Um, because it is required by law. You can't get around it. A lot of people get annoyed, but it is for your protection. And then sometimes people lose money and then they want more protection. <laughs> You can't have it both ways. You can't have a lot of regulation and a lot of protection and then still be able to do whatever it is that you want. They, they don't go hand in hand. Okay. You either have the, the wild, wild west, AKA something like crypto, which is highly decentralized and highly deregulated, meaning the government is not really involved, although they're inching their way towards it. And then you have the financial services market, which is highly regulated. Like, to the nth, 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 nth degree and then some, which is why I'm always very precautionary when I get on here because of my background and because I know what it's like to be licensed and get in trouble and also to be non-licensed and not want to get in trouble. So uh, people are funny though. <laughs> they want it both ways. So number one question is what are you willing to accept? And this is relating to your personal risk tolerance. Number two question, your personal time horizon. How long before you need the money? So th this is gonna connect to number five, but I want you to think about for this, and you may have different buckets of money, right? You may have some money that's for a home purchase. You may have some money that's for uh, your emergency fund. You may have some money that's for your fund money. You may have some money that's for your diamond earrings. You may have some money, <laughs> That's for your new car. You may have some money that's for your children's education. You may have some money that's for your retirement. You may have some money that is for, um, I don't know, your like 50th or 60th birthday. Okay. Whatever that money is earmarked for, because every single one has a different time horizon. So you can't just put it all lumped together. Okay. So your risk tolerance. You will have one that's overall, but you may have risk tolerance that's specific to the individual investment type, and that's because of the time horizon, right? So how long before you need this money? If you wanna buy a new car in two years, that's your time horizon. If you want to retire and it's not gonna be for 20 years, that's the time horizon. Two different goals, two different time horizons, two potentially very different uh, risk tolerances, how much risk you're willing to take. Okay. So the third thing that I want you to ask the key consideration is around your investment experience. What knowledge or personal experience, prior experience do you have? And in the world of investment, we do take into account your, this knowledge, right? Meaning you could have read up a ton of stuff on different types of investments. You could be licensed, right? Like in my case, I was licensed to sell certain types of investments like mutual funds. How old was I? 
24. Okay. So I was licensed to sell investments here in Canada by the time I was 24. So for 20 years, I had my license. Now I had started to invest uh, before I got my license, but not by much. I was making like $10 and 50 cents an hour. When I first started selling um, and being able to recommend investments to clients, I was making, I think to like $28,000 a year with a college degree. Okay. So I was helping people invest millions, billions of dollars, right? Um, Cause I had that knowledge. I didn't have the personal experience, but because I had passed a test, a certificate, like all of these requirements, quite rigorous, I might add, I was able to explain the pros and cons and then I had to do specific product knowledge around the different types of investments such that I was qualified to give investment advice. Okay. That's why I say you have to go to somebody who's licensed and go to somebody who's accredited because it's going to depend on where in the world you are and what kind of language they use. So if you have done all the reading, but you're not licensed, chances are your investment advisor is going to say if you've had zero experience like you you've actually never put your hard earned uh money into the game right that you don't know what you're gonna do you have no idea how you're gonna react if all of a sudden you put in a hundred bucks and tomorrow the market drops and you've already lost 30 percent you've already it's gone from 100 to 70 because some high risk investments let's use bitcoin as an example right? That if you put in a hundred bucks, uh, last week, it, it would, it would have dropped because it's lower than it was a week ago. Right. Um, would you have been okay with that? And some people say, yeah, fine. Until it actually happens in real life. And then they go, take all my money out, please. You need to sell, sell, sell because I'm losing money. Like I can't afford to lose it all. Uh, okay. So then this is where you have to kind of give it your best shot and know that your answers may change and I expect them to change over time, which is why this exercise is worthwhile to do uh, at the beginning. And then as you continue, and I'm going to give you some recommendations as we go along. So that's number three question is your investment experience. What knowledge or personal experience do you have in investing? and typically in the type of investment that you want to invest. So you might be very experienced in the stock market. You may be there, but maybe you have zero experience in options trading, as an example. You might be very experienced in real estate, but you have zero experience in crypto, as an example. Okay, um, some people only do uh, like yield farming or staking on crypto, and some people only do altcoins or meme coins or DeFi. So, Again, I'm, I'm saying all of these things not to confuse you. It's to give you terms so that you are familiar with what is available so that you can then go into your own research and just see what do I need to get more acquainted with? What do I need to increase my learning capabilities and my skills? Money is a skill. Nobody walks around one day and suddenly is like, I'm a genius at how to do money. Even if you even if you are born into a wealthy family and i've talked about this before the wealthiest families their business is uh is is money it's not the the business that they've built it's now preservation of capital and making sure that what they have is not going to be eroded because the people that they ha like have been born into their family have no idea how to steward that generational wealth they want that money to now last like the Rockefellers, like the, the, um, it's the Waltons for Walmart. Like they want that money to last, not just for the people who made it, but for their children and their children's children, which is scriptural, right? The Bible says a wise man leaves, leaves an inheritance for his children's children. So we want to follow a good example in knowing there is enough for our children's children, but we build that skill over time, okay? And it doesn't need to take a long time. It can be quick, but you have to actually put it into, into practice.
So number four, for a key consideration is your personal net worth. So what portion of your wealth does this investment represent? Typically, typically, the higher the net worth, and your net worth is simply everything that you own, and we're not counting stuff like your like your furniture and all that stuff. Like, because at the end of the day, if you had to sell and liquidate the stuff inside of your house, what could you sell? Right? Like you could sell your house, you could sell your cars, you could sell your motorcycles. Um, maybe you could sell some of your artwork or your jewelry. But even then, I don't typically count those. You definitely could sell or get rid of or liquidate your investments, your stocks, your bonds, um, your your portions in real other real estate holdings, right? In businesses, you could sell these as assets. <coughs> Excuse me. The higher your net worth, which is simply what you own minus what you owe. So if you owe car notes, uh, loan payments, uh, what is the total amount, um, including your mortgage? And it was it would be the net effect, right? The plus and the minus. What's left over? That's your net worth. So the higher the net worth, the less of an impact a thousand or ten thousand or a hundred thousand would have. Right. Like if you are a multimillionaire, if you have if you're a billionaire losing a million dollars, like that's why the, the, the press talks about Elon Musk, like his and Jeff Bezos, like their net worth has gone up and down by millions of dollars. Meh. And people complain because they're like, oh, they're so rich. Yeah, they are. But in the grand scheme of things, it is a small drop in the bucket. Right. The numbers feel large because they are and because the average human doesn't have that much. But if we just look at it as a percentage, those numbers become more absolute, meaning what what pie, what percentage of your pie. Right. Like what slice of the pie is this investment that you're looking at making? And if it is a bigger slice of the pie. Then the other pieces of this equation are going to be way more important and your financial advisor is going to also take that into account so if you've never done any investing before you have zero net worth and you're like i'm putting it all on a thousand dollars on black <laughs> they're they're gonna caution you and go uh okay now, if all of the other numbers and facts and figures and the information jive, then it still may be appropriate for you. It might be good for you. But I'm just letting you know, because oftentimes people get very upset because it's like, it's my money. Why can't I just do that? Because when you lose the money or it drops and then you decide, I want to sell. And so you really do lose the money because you have confirmed and cemented that loss then you complain and you hold the person responsible who did the investing for you when it was ultimately your decision. Okay. So number five, your personal goals. What do you want to achieve with this money? So your time horizon, your risk tolerance and your personal goals are deeply connected. Right. So I gave some examples at the beginning. I'm not going to repeat them now. So I want you to think about and this is why you can have different buckets of money, different pools of money. If we were to use like a Dave Ramsey analogy, which he's not my favorite money person, because I feel like he comes. It's solid advice, but it comes from a place of lack and limitation and fear. And God does not give us a spirit of fear. He gives us power, love and a sound mind. And so if you have the power to know what it is that you want to do with your money, even if you're not 100% sure on all the steps, then be confident in what it is that you decide to do, right? And then the path will be made clear. Uh, people will show up. Maybe that's why you're hopping on this today. So every single bucket of money has a different goal. It has a different purpose. It has a different job. And so I want you to think about it like um, an, an army, right? In an army, they have one singular goal and purpose. They want to win the fight. They want to win the war. But every single soldier might be deployed in a different way in order to win the battle, right? They might have a different plan. They might have a different maneuver. They might have a different uh, way of moving. 
So your buckets of money will all have one singular goal and purpose, which is hopefully to enhance your life, to make your life simpler, easier, better in some way so that you get more of what it is that you want and less of what it is that you don't want. At the end of the day, the only person that determines that is you, even though it might feel like everybody else in the world has a lot of control over what does and doesn't happen. That's not true. You have complete control. It's just a matter of, do you know the rules? Do you understand how to play the game? Because life is a game and the world of money is a game. The world of business is a game. Side note, that's why I called my podcast Master the Sales Game because sales is a game. Business is a game. Money is a game. Life is ultimately a game. And you get to determine how much fun you have. And there are some rules that we must follow for the betterment of humankind, right? Because if we just all made our own rules willy nilly, we would be like stepping all over each other. But a lot of the rules that you think are like truth, they're not true for you. They might be true for somebody else, but you get to step out of that matrix and decide to go and and stay in your own and then rework the rules for you, which includes your money. And that's why money really does matter. And it matters for God too. Otherwise, he wouldn't have talked about it so many freaking times in the Bible. So I digress. So you could have different and specific answers for each of your investments. And yes, you can do this even if you're only putting in like $10 into this and this and this and this because, you know, Dave Ramsey with the envelopes, the system works. But again, I, I want to expand you I I don't want you to contract and be like, I don't have enough, so I can't invest. I started with $25 a paycheck. I was making $10.50 in one job, and I actually had a second job that I was making $8 and I think 25 cents, minimum wage, straight out of college, right? So why? Why did I have two jobs? Because I had a certain lifestyle that I wanted to live. I had bills to pay. I didn't want to move back home. And so I was willing to do whatever it took so that I did not have to do that. I love my family. They are my number one behind God. But I did not want to go back home. I wanted, I had lived independently and freely as my own human outside of those rules because I I had escaped the matrix of that and I wasn't planning to go back. So I did what I needed to do. Some of you may need to do what you need to do, even if it makes you uncomfortable, even if it feels like, oh, that wasn't what I was expecting. Sorry, right? Like I never expected to build a business. I never expected that once I started to build a business that I would have to put some of it on hold or actually completely rework it because what I had built didn't actually support the kind of lifestyle that I am walking into, right? because every season of life is a little bit different. And so it is important for us to evaluate. And that's why this is not a set it and forget it. You have to constantly go back as things happen in your life in order to assess and properly match up and align all of these different pieces, right? When I first started investing, $25 a month, um, the biggest ticket item that I saved for was diamond earrings. Because frankly, I was tired of the narrative that said, you know, I was waiting, I was waiting to get married. And I thought, well, that's going to be a big diamond. Don't at me. I, I like nice things. Um, And so I knew that I wasn't going to buy my own ring. I was not going to propose to a man. I wanted him to propose to me and I wanted him to buy my ring and I wanted him to buy the ring that I wanted. Not necessarily the ring that he could afford, okay? I don't know. This is for somebody right now. And, um, you know, back then it was like no more than three months salary. My ring was more than three months salary worth for my, at the time, boyfriend, right? I was very clear though. This is this is what I want and I'm not, I'm not willing to lower my standard. Um, so when it came to diamond earrings, I was tired of waiting because I had waited four years 
it was four years before we got engaged. We got married after six years of dating. So this is for somebody right now. Just because you're waiting doesn't mean it's not going to happen. I knew after six months, right? Because he was a good investment and I was a good investment for him, right? Because it's not always about money. You're investing your time. You're investing your effort. We talked about at the beginning that while investing and the, the pieces that I'm sharing with you here are specifically related to money because we're talking about money matters. It also can fall under the purview of relationships, of love, of health, of different aspects of wealth, right? Your peace of mind, your mental wealth, your emotional stability, your, your physical well-being, the, uh, the joy and the peace uh, that you feel every day, right? Those are great investments that you would then reap the rewards of. So after six months, I, we knew. We knew that we were going to get married. I did not expect it to take four years. Let me just say, that's a story for another day, okay? So after four years get engaged, the planning took a little bit longer. Um, in between all of that, I was frustrated because it was taking so long. And so I decided that I wanted diamond earrings because I wasn't gonna buy my own ring. So that's what I decided that I wanted to invest in. And that's what I saved up for, right? So is that frivolous? Maybe. At this stage in my life, would I still save for, you know, other types of diamonds? Yes, potentially. Does it have as much impact on me today as it did back then? No. Okay. And, and I'm sharing this because I want you to know that sometimes we do outgrow the things that are important. And that's why this process, this practice of evaluating the questions, oh, I'm getting hot, is very important for us, right? Like that you would need to, um, to review it. I want you to review it and not, this is not something that you're going to put on the shelf and just set and forget. I want this to be on your phone uh, as a reminder, and I'm going to tell you when you should be reviewing it with with a certain things that may come up. Okay, so the reason why it's so important that you understand that each bucket of investing of investments is different is because they may have a different purpose. They have a goal, they have a different timeline, they have a different uh, amount of risk that you're willing to take. Right. And so based off of all those factors, it's going to be almost like a little bit of a personal algorithm for you and your investments to be like, what's going to spit out? OK. And even if you're doing like self-serve types of investing, again, if you filled out your KYC, you know your client correctly, accurately for you, you haven't fudged anything that the systems that we operate in, the money systems that we operate in. Are designed to keep you safe some is that frustrating yes it is sometimes but at the end of the day when something goes hiccup right which invariably there is always an opportunity for something to go a little bit bumpy that you're going to be very grateful like who here has not gotten a, a call or a text or something if your credit card or your bank accounts have been flagged for potential fraud and sometimes it's, it is real. And you're like, Woo, thank God that that happened because I'm not on the hook for A, B, and C, right? So that's why the protection mechanisms are in place. And we got to take the good with the not so good. And so it's really important that when you're feeding information that you don't fudge this information, like the answers to the questions that people are asking and the systems are asking, because without it, it will not help you. And you update it as things change because then you will have access to different options which we'll talk about in a minute so the other thing that i want you to understand right all of these five key considerations on top of the three key factors they work together there's a synergy that happens and that is important so that you understand your overall personal wealth goals Otherwise, you're going to get frustrated. And if you don't give this information to whoever's helping you, which could be you, right? If you're not honest with yourself, 
you will be frustrated because you have different expectations. I said at the beginning that it's important that you do this exercise with your money partner, whoever that is, whether it's your spouse, your, um, your children, your parents, right? Whoever you're making money decisions with together, you need to sit down and answer these questions. I would recommend that you do it separately first and then come together and review together and then potentially do it again and answer and come to an agreement. Because you may find that there's differences in each of these questions. So the other piece, because some of you are gonna go, I'm gonna diversify, Susan. I've been told to diversify. We use all these fancy words and it's like, how much do you have? Are we putting the cart before the horse? Because if you have a hundred bucks and you try to buy 10 different stocks on your own, it's going to be a long time before you see any traction because you're going to be buying a fraction of a percentage of each company. If you see that the market goes up 20%, well, 20% on 10 bucks is not much. It's not much, right? 20% on $100 is 20 bucks. Meh. So it's tempting, again, to follow blindly, like I shared at the beginning, and I said, you know, the experts out there are going to tell you to invest in an index fund. Uh, they're not wrong, but does it apply for everybody? No. Does it get most people over the hump and the hurdle of just staying invested? Yes, but you have to stick with it. And if you don't, if you don't even know why you're invested in an index fund, chances are you're going to defeat the whole purpose of being in an index fund. Does this make sense? Are you tracking with me? So if, you follow blindly with the advice that says, I need to diversify. I need to spread my eggs out so they can't be all in one basket. But nobody's asked, how much do you have to invest in the first place? When I started with 25 bucks, I put it into a mutual fund so that I could diversify, but I only bought one mutual fund because $25. I mean, eh, who cares at this point, right? Uh, it was more around the practice of just getting going and the discipline and the self-control to stick with it, regardless of how much it goes up and down, the fluctuations and the volatility. So too much diversification, you're going to be, especially if you're self-managing, you're going to spend a lot of time managing your money. The amounts in each bucket are going to be so small that you're going to wonder, why am I doing this? So, and then you're going to want to give up. So don't do that. Okay. So the other considerations that I want you to just percolate over, because this will bring up your hidden beliefs, your background, your experience, or things that you just want to have like an honest conversation with yourself on. So the first question that I'm going to ask you around, because we've now done like the, the real homework, right? Is these are the hidden questions that they may or may not ask you that you may not even know about yourself. So what return are you invest? Uh, what return are you expecting? Like when I say what makes a good investment, do you have an idea of what that return is? So some years ago, when I was um, speaking in a room, and I was talking about it, investing and it was right before I had written my ABCs of building wealthy book side note if you need that please go and, and, and grab that you can send me a message saying wealth and I will send you the link to, to go and purchase that so I was talking about you know rate of returns and like okay if you let's just use like a six to eight percent and and the number one question that people asked was what do I invest in in order to get six to eight percent that's the wrong question to ask because it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what the rate of return is if it doesn't 
match your needs. Do you know what you need in order to get the goal that you desire? Does it match your time horizon, the goal that you have, and your risk tolerance? Does it match the kind of investments that you have experience with or that you would be comfortable even investing in in the first place? So that's like these are honest things that you need to assess for yourself. But at the end of the day, because of the media and because of these conversations around money, we often do have these hidden expectations that we might not even realize that it's important for you to identify now. Because if, you, if you're going to set yourself up for success, we need to know what success looks like, right? And we need to break down the old definitions of success and really personalize that for you. So what return are you expecting? When you invest money, do you have an expectation for what you, what you want to get out of it? Is there a minimum benchmark that you don't think it's worth for you to go below? And again, there's no right or wrong answer because these are going to be personal for you. So you have to decide what that is. And again, if you're with a partner like me and my husband, we have these conversations together. Okay. Number two, how much access do you need to your money? Because that automatically will limit certain types of investments that you can or cannot go into. Because if you need to access your money immediately, there's going to be certain considerations. And again, I can't tell you what that is because it's going to depend on what's available, where you are in the world. Different places have different um, financial instruments, meaning you may have different regulations around money market funds or bonds or short term investments or T-bills or cash, the CODs, term deposits, all that kind of stuff, including stocks, penny stocks, uh, crypto, like all of this kind of stuff. Okay. There are millions of investments, millions, like even if we just went on publicly traded, millions, there's so many different options. So this is why I can't give you like specifics um, and nobody actually should be giving you specifics unless they actually sit down with you and they go through a very comprehensive review. Side note, for those who might be interested, if you sit down with a fee based planner, I would expect no less than $1,500 to sit down with somebody to do a plan. I used to do them. That's why I say this, okay? Uh, no less than $1,500. It's gonna go from there and, and go up and up depending on the complexity of your personal situation. So um, how much access do you need to your money, okay? Because if you had an emergency, would this be the money that you would draw from? Or do you have other sources? And again, we have different buckets. So you may decide there's a certain bucket that this would be my available pool, right? It's gonna vary. Um, I remember watching a video uh, way back in the day now, and um, it's not relevant who the person is, but it's somebody that you would know now, but at the time he was well, less well known and had a huge net worth, right? Uh, over a hundred million dollars in net worth. And, and so this is part of the reason why I do this money matter series, or I'm starting the series starting today is because the amount of money that you have in the bank or, or any place, we're just going to use bank as just like a placeholder, right? Um, it does not negate the fact that people have fears around money. And so this particular person did not feel comfortable having less than $2 million in cash just sitting in a bank account, knowing that it wasn't making any money, but because of where they had been financially just a short period of time ago, that they needed to have that liquid. That's a spirit of fear. It's a spirit of poverty. And yet had a net worth of over a hundred million dollars. Okay. So they wanted to be able to access that. And to them, that gave them safety. It gave them certainty. It helped to offset some of the other riskier ventures that they were investing in. And it alleviated stress. Now, I can't say what that is for you. But what I do know is that I have seen some people who have zero dollars 
and they do not have a spirit of poverty. They do not have a spirit of fear. They just don't have the amount of finances or the finance, the financial means in the real, in the real world yet to match where they are inside their internal state of being. Right? So I say this because I want you to recognize that it doesn't matter what you see or don't see around you. Where you are today is important because without knowing your current state, your current state of mind, your current state of affairs in your in your life and your business and your wealth, you cannot then properly create a plan that actually will will be implementable and successful. You you cannot do that if you don't know where you are. And so the tendency is because money brings guilt and shame and a lot of fear and we don't talk about enough at least not with a lot of honesty okay and so if we don't have these honest conversations then you are starting from a place that does not exist like it would be like your phone in your gps you're about to drive to get somewhere and the Wi-Fi, the data is not connecting. So it, it can't figure out where you are. Well, it's not going to give you a map, right? It, it literally cannot give you a map. It'll say not connected and it will quit. <laughs> it will quit. So we cannot do the same thing by fudging numbers or being inaccurate with ourselves and with those that are here to help us when we're pulling around a lot of baggage that really if nothing else, I want you to just break free of that and just give yourself permission to like lay it at the doorstep and close the door on it because it's from an old season. So the third consideration that I want you to think about that are on top of the five key, okay? The five key ones are the ones that an investment advisor, a financial planner, um, somebody who's helping you manage your, your money should be asking you. The third one that I want you to think about, right? And they may still ask these ones, good ones will, what is your overall tax situation now? And what will it be down the road? Because there are certain, and these are more advanced strategies, right? Um, but this is what wealth is all about. So when we start to create long-term generational wealth, there are certain considerations. And again, the number one question that uh, immediately comes up when people say this, I don't want to make a lot of money because I don't want to pay a lot of taxes. We're coming on tax season right now where I am in the world in Canada and probably in the US where a lot of my clients are. And a lot of people start talking about, oh my God, I can't believe how much taxes I paid. Yeah, that's great. You know why? Because you fund the economy with the things that are required to survive. Our roads, our, our government, our education system, uh, our waterways, like these are all dependent on us paying taxes. So this is good. The more you make, the more you give. That's also good because if you make more, you pay more in taxes. Now, there are certain loopholes and all that kind of stuff. We're not going to get into that because I'm not your tax advisor either. Um, but it is important for your financial well-being that you take into consideration if you're expecting your wealth to change, the status of your wealth to change, for your income bracket to change, there are certain strategies that you may employ, but you need to talk to uh, not just your, your financial advisor, but in this case, you would be well served to talk to a um, somebody who specializes in what you're trying to do, whether that's a, a tax accountant or a uh, like a tax-based financial planner, which there are some, okay? That was a whole mouthful. Okay, I'm gonna pause. This is gonna feel like you're drinking from a fire hose. So I, I also just wanna be cognizant of that. Um, give yourself grace, okay? I've been doing this for a long time. Um, and this isn't even like super detailed. So uh, I just have a, a, a bit more to go through. So we'll see how this goes. So according to, what is it, ePower? 
I want you to think about right now, are you making any kind of investments? And again, no guilt, no shame, no condemnation, right? It just is what it is. And if you want your investments to do what they can and should do, which is to generate a potential return for you, the sooner you can start, the better. It's like that saying, the best time to plant a tree was 20 years ago. Same with your investments. The best time to start investing was 20 years ago. But that being said, the second best time is now. What do you invest in? I don't know. That's for you to decide, right? Um, can I give you some you know, guidance? Sure, I could. Uh, that's where your input is very important. The questions that you ask, because Tony Robbins says the quality of our questions determines the quality of our life. If we want better results, if we want a better life, then we have to ask better questions. So if you don't ask any questions, you're not going to get any answers. That's why the Bible says, ask and you should get, right? Like you need to ask first. That's the starting of the process. <laughs> we ask for wisdom and we receive it. Most of us are not asking. Our people perish for lack of knowledge. There's knowledge everywhere. So there is really no excuse in today's day and age for us to not have the information that we need in order to make the appropriate decisions, to be informed. If you're not informed today in this age of AI, Google, information up the wazoo, it is because you are choosing to be ignorant. And I don't mean that in a mean way. I am saying this out of love and kindness and regard for you because I know that more is possible for you and that it doesn't actually take a lot more effort than what you're currently doing. You just need to redirect that focus in a way that serves you, that really does serve you, okay? And get rid of the guilt, get rid of the old like, oh, I made that mistake, who cares? That was in the past, just let it go now. So if you're in your in your 30s, according to epower.com, the this is according to as of 2020. Okay. So as of 2020, the median, which is like the middle of the road, retirement contribution for people in their 30s was a little bit over eleven thousand dollars. So if you were if you were in, if you are in your 30s right now and you are saving more than eleven thousand dollars, then you are above the median. You are above the middle of the pack. Okay. If you are below that, it might be something for you to consider because the median, which is, and these are, these are American, okay, which is the vast majority of the people that I serve. But with a global audience now, there is Americanized opportunity everywhere, okay? Maybe we'll get into that another day. In your 40s, the median retirement contribution was just a little bit over 15,000. So if you're in your 40s and you have not been able to, to contribute towards your retirement $15,000, again, this is just an opportunity for you to go, is there room? Is there an opportunity here? What's getting in the way? Am I allowing other things that might feel really urgent or pressing? And I get it. And, and you might be coming at me and saying like, Susan, do you realize what's going on in the world? Yeah, I do. I do realize what's going on in the world. I have gone through multiple recessions in my entire life and especially in my career doing this exact work for clients. And so I share this in order to help provide context and content that's going to be valuable for you so that you can make better decisions so that you make the changes that you want to see. I've, I already know what to do, right? Like, if you don't know what to do, then it would behoove you to figure that out sooner rather than later. Because we're actually in good times. It could be way worse because we're technically not in a recession. Okay? So in your 50s, the median retirement contribution was just a little bit over 16000 and in the 60s, it was 12,500, a little bit over that, okay? Now you may be thinking, well, why are people still contributing their 60s? Well, 
because maybe they can't afford to retire, right? So that tells me that number one is never too late. And number two, that there are certain benchmarks that are already established. And so if you don't know where to start, I would look at that as maybe a potential goal. Now, does that fit for you and what you need in order to retire? I don't know. But short of sitting with you personally, this is the best that I got for you. Okay? So it gives you at least a benchmark. It gives you a starting place. It gives you an idea. And then, depending on the time horizon, all that stuff, we would then, you could calculate, and there's several, you know, retirement calculators, you could plunk, plunk this in and say, okay, if I could invest in my 40s, $15,000 a year, and I want to retire by 65, what would that give me? Okay, so that would give you a, an idea of what to do next. So remember that a good investment, because we I asked you at the beginning, what is good? I want you to define it right? A good investment for one person, which is you, it may not be appropriate for your sister or your brother or your mother or your uncle or your cousin or your neighbor down the street or the coworker or your clients. It may not be appropriate for other people. It may not be appropriate for you. What's appropriate for me may not be appropriate for you just because I'm invested in stocks, bonds, real estate, crypto of varying degrees. Does that mean that you should be invested in it? I don't know. Maybe. It depends, right? So it's important to take time to answer the five key considerations, and I gave you three additional ones. I We described the three-legged stool, right? The three key factors. Your answers will change over time, and it's a good idea to review that and to update every time your personal situation changes. So here are the benchmarks or the, the milestones that you want to keep note of. So anytime that you make a change, if there's a transition or a, or a, a pivot or a, um, a, a like a change, right? A changing over. So a change in career, when you're going to school or ending school, right? Even if you're later in life, if you start a new business, if you go into a partnership or you're ending a partnership, and this could be a business partnership, it could be a life partnership. If you are moving, if you are getting married or divorced, if you are having children, if your children are leaving the house, right? So all of these kind of major things that happen in life, there are opportunities for you to review because it could change your all of the stuff. Like when I had a breakdown, and my career ended, our, my risk tolerance changed. It's now changed again, right? When my daughter uh, had some health issues, again, risk tolerance changed. My appetite for what I was willing to do, especially around my time investment, shrank. It was non-existent, okay? So I want you to consider where you are and knowing that it will change. So again, this is why I said, this is not a set it and forget it. Anybody that thinks that just because you have invested in something and even an index fund, you need to review it. You need to review it at least once a year. Uh, if you have major changes going on, because a year is a long time, it feels very short. If something changes in between that time, it is incumbent upon you to really review and to assess, does this still fit, right? Because oftentimes it's like a, it's like old underwear, right? Like at some point you're just like, well, it still works, does it? Maybe you should get rid of it. Like, does it make you feel good? Does it fit you anymore? Is it stretched out? Is it like losing its elastic? Like, is it stained? Is it no longer fit like your whole wardrobe? Do you not like how it makes you feel? Do you just keep like relegating it to the back? Like just because you have it doesn't mean that you should keep it, right? And it's the same for investing because if you find that you just started investing or you got into something and it was a newer to you type of investment and then all of a sudden, uh, well, maybe not all of a sudden, gradually over time you realize, you know what? I Like every time I look at this, it kind of annoys me. 
get rid of it. It's now robbing you of your peace of mind, right? So the criteria by which we define what's good or not good, it really is not just about rate of return, although that is probably the most popular way that we would define good, right? And that's why when people say, and when I've shared like, okay, let's just use an average investment return of like 68%, immediately the question was, what do you invest in to get that rate of return? I mean, there's lots of things. That's the wrong question because I don't know if that even will help you. Does this make sense, right? Brianka, how do I connect with you to become a client and get started, Susan? Brianka, send me a message and I will see what, um, what you need and how I can help. Thank you for asking, okay? So we're gonna group our investments into short-term, medium-term, and long-term, okay? How do we determine this? I'm gonna give you some guidelines, but you decide, because it's your money, it's not mine, okay? So short-term is going to be um, generally under a year, but in my estimation, one to three years is what I would categorize personally and what I have in the past. I am probably more on the conservative side while I swing for the fences. Okay, so one to three years. Now, what I have noticed is that the general investment world has started to shrink their timelines. To me, that's risky. To me, that's inaccurate. And also to me, it speaks to the shortened attention spans of the human race, which I don't actually think is a plus. Like these you know, instant dopamine hits that we're so used to, it is the opposite of what a good investor and building wealth requires. Building wealth requires discipline. Building wealth requires commitment. Building wealth requires self-control. And that does not happen in a day. That happens over time. Like if you want to build generational wealth, which good investments form a part of, then it is really important that you can, you can carry it out over years. Z-z-z-z-z-z-z-z right? Like if, and, and, and maybe I'm talking to the wrong people. So you, you let me know. Do you, cause some people just want their money to last their life. And then they're like, I'm going out with a bang. I'm going to spend it all. I'm not taking it with me and I'm not leaving it behind because they're going to have to work for what they got. If that's you, you can put a one in the comment and no, sh- no shade. That's, we're good, right? But if you want to leave a legacy for not just your children, but your children's children, put a two in the comments, okay? Um, Because if that's the case, then we need to really think about a longer time frame. That long term is not just five years, it's 10 years, it's 20 years, it's 30 years. And I get it. If you're on the, the, the south end of life, you're gonna feel like that's squeezing you. Are you letting your own limitations around what is possible for your lifespan and the quality of life that you could have dictate what is available for you to have, right? Like when we look at some of these people, like KFC, uh, what is his name? Colonel Sanders, (laughs) Colonel Sanders, he didn't start KFC until I think he was 50s or 60s. There are so many examples of people who built generational legacy type of wealth that has has changed the way that we think about life, right? They've become like monumental forces in our social fabric, so to speak, that they didn't start in their 20s. That's That's not when they, you know, the Mark Zuckerbergs of the world are few and far between where that idea started in their early 20s and they were a bajillionaire before they were 30. That's not the typical identity of a successful entrepreneur, to be honest. It's been the other way around. It is the wisdom, the experience, the skill building, the discipline, the commitment, the focus, the um, even like being able to build your family. Like building a family is like building a business. If you have a good family unit, you are a good business person. 
because you can't have a functional family and a dysfunctional build, uh, business. Now you could, but to me, they go hand in hand because if, if the, a lot of the same strategies, a lot of the, the same uh, workings, right? Good boundaries, good emotional support, good communication, um, focus, goals, values, like all of this, if you're on the same page as your family, you like literally are a healthy family, then you have put a good investment of your time in that, then you're going to reap a reward, right? Like you're, you're going to have fruit. You're going to have healthy whole children who love and care about you and you for them. It's the same with your business. Your business, if you pour your life and your effort and your energy and your money investment in there, then it should produce something for you. It should be producing an outcome, which if you are a business person, the main marker of your business should be money. But the money should be coming as a byproduct of the people that you're serving, your, the people that you help, the good that your products or services do in the world. So short term, I don't know who that was for. Short term is usually one year. I'm encouraging all of us to expand that out and consider that short term could be as long as three years, okay? Zero to three years. Anything under a year, you're going to be limited with what options that you have. Here's why. Because for short term investments, here's the key considerations that I want you to think about. Number one, that chances are you're going to want to easily access that money. That will eliminate quite a number of opportunities for you. Number two, that the there is a high likelihood that your original investment won't be lost. That means, because I want you to think, if you need that money in a year, if you need that money in two or even three years, do, are you going to be okay if you put in a thousand dollars and that money drops to five hundred? And it, it's okay. Whatever your answer is, your answer, right? Most people, the answer is going to be no. Most people are going to go, well, if I need that money in a year, I need to make sure that that money comes back to me intact, in right? So the high likelihood that your original investment won't be lost is typically something that you would really, really want to have in place or be considering for something that is short term. And then the third consideration for short term investments is the higher guarantee of a likely rate of return, meaning you want to know if I, so that's why like term deposits or um, CODs are, or CDs are more prevalent on short term investing. Usually you could do it up to five years, but most people are not going to invest for five years in a CD unless the rates are really high and you think that the rates are going to go low. Okay. So the higher guarantee of a likely rate of return. Now, it doesn't mean that you're getting a high rate of return. It means that you know, or there's a higher probability that you will know what that return is before you make the investment. And that means that there's less risk for you to make the investment, right? So if I say to you, Brianka, um, you want to make an investment for a year, I'm going to give you 4%, right? I'm going to give you 4% because then I know like as the bank, the bank is going to then go and lend that money out and make 10% because that might be the going rate on loans right now. So I'll give you 4% for the year, but I'm going to make, still make some money because I'm still a business, right? Um, and that's good business. So I'm going to make money, but now I can guarantee you the 4%. So you're okay with 4%. Because in a year, you're going to get $1,000, you're going to get your 4% back, and you're, you're going to need that money. Does that make sense? Now, somebody might go, well, you could have made a lot more if you had put it over here. Again, but they don't, they don't know why you needed that money. <laughs> if that investment... Like, could, could I give you that same $1,000 and say, hey, Branca, go put it into Bitcoin? Yes, you could. But you could lose it all. Is it a high probability that it will go up? Possibly, right? 
But this halving that's coming up in a few days as, as the blockchain kind of winds down, it is unlike any other halving since the creation of Bitcoin. So all of the, the markers, all of the past benchmarks, they, they're they not matching up. And as a result, while we can speculate, it is purely speculation, right? So in past halvings, it has gone up because supply automatically reduces, pushes the price up. And so it is a high probability that just by virtue of supply and demand, it should do that. But we can't guarantee that. And almost like clockwork, it goes up and then it comes down because everybody that made a whole bunch of money, they now are selling off, right? So when we understand how the markets work and what is appropriate or not appropriate for us, then we can make the best decisions for ourselves, right? Then when we have the basket of goods of here are all the different types of investments that are available for you as you're talking to somebody who's licensed to do that, or you yourself are going onto a site where you can go on and you've taken on burden of risk because you've signed off the, the know your client and said, I am okay. Click, 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 click. Yes, I can take this risk on myself. You will do that on any exchange, whether you're selling and buying stocks, bonds, options, penny stocks, crypto, any of it, right? When you take on the responsibility, there is no one to, and he's saying blame, but like the buck stops with you. And that's why it's important that before you do that, that you have the information that you need, okay? So short-term investments, those are the key things that you want to think about. The medium-term investments then is the benchmark that they're saying is one to five years. Um, three to five, three to 10, right? Again, five years is kind of the benchmark, but it's going to depend. It's going to depend on your situation. It's going to depend on your circumstances. Again, I would like to encourage everybody to expand time horizons so you think longer term. Part of this also ties into how I teach business because when we look at business as a get rich quick, can you get rich quick? Yes, you can. And a business is the best way to do it because with a job, a job is guaranteed, right? It's guaranteed income. You know what you're going to get. They promise you a certain amount and you show up and give them what it is that they requ require. So it's low risk, low return. Because there's that guarantee. A business has high risk, potential high return, no guarantee. You could work for 50, 60, 100 hours and get nothing back in terms of a dollar value you might still get a lot of back in terms of your own personal growth, satisfaction, joy, peace, like just a joie de vivre, right? All of that is important. But as it relates to a measurement of business success, it's not a real business if it doesn't make money, not according to the tax authorities and not according to me, right? That is not a measurement of you as a human, that it's a measurement of your business. You are not the same as your business. They are totally separate things, okay? I don't know who that was for. So if we expand out, because too often when we do stuff in our business, we're like, I do a thing and I want the result. I do a thing and I want the result. Can God breathe on something and make that happen? Sure he can. But when we have an expectation that every single thing that we do is an instant like gold mine, we set ourselves up for failure because we are not willing to do the work that's required to be consistent at anything, to get good at anything. Investing is the same. Investing requires us to do something day in and day out. Now, you might not be the one doing it. There might be somebody else the, doing the doing of it. But if you check your investments every day, it's going to go like this. It doesn't matter what investment you're in. It's going to go like this you're going to drive yourself crazy. And that's why people sell low and they buy high because they're riding the emotional wave of how that money has made them feel. And they're anticipating certain things because they are dreaming of possibility 
and they're operating opposite to what the market is doing because they're not thinking about it from a logical perspective. When you answer these questions before you even have money in the game or before you add more money to whatever position that you have, you are going to be much more level headed and able to answer these not from a place of like heated emotion, but from a stable grounded rooted place right and and if if you are somebody who believes or has deep faith i i would encourage you to pray and ask god and ask the holy spirit to help you right because he's our helper so medium term investments one to five years it could be up to 10 years now again when i am counseling i generally tend to be a little more conservative knowing that miracles happen like that and they do, um, but we have to give grace for them. 